welcome to another episode of Out of the Woodwork Podcast, brought to you by Axminster Tools with me, Sean Evely. Today, I am joined by Hattie Speed, a talented designer and maker. She is an advocate for encouraging young people to take up woodworking as a career, and particularly working to inspire more women into creative careers. She is the founder of This Girl Makes, which is an on and offline community of makers and designers that aims to celebrate and promote women in craft and design. So Hattie, thank you for joining me today. No worries, it's nice to speak with you, Sean. Yeah, well, a lot of people won't know, we actually both studied at Rycote Wood Furniture Centre. Uh, can you give us, I think I left, I think you left a year before I started, to be honest. Yes, I don't remember there being an overlap, but um, now that I'm a teacher there, I, I definitely remember seeing you when I popped my head into the workshop every now and yeah. then. So, yeah. And I think <laughs> when I was in secondary school, my A-level piece was entered into the Young Furniture Makers Awards, which you, I think, won that year for the, the university section. Ah, so okay. <laughs> our, cra- our paths crossed quite early, but we would not have known. Yeah. So can you give us, for people that don't know, a background on yourself and your education? Uh, sure thing. Uh, yeah, my name's Hattie Speed. I grew up in Northumberland in a town called Hexham, so quite a rural rural place. Um, and went to um, I went to sixth form after school and did product design, which uh, product design A level, uh, which is sort of where it all started really. Um, and then I was always certain that I was going to go to college after sixth form to do an art foundation year having always been very creative um, and that's like a course where you do lots of different creative subjects and then you decide which one you want to specialize in. Um, so I specialized in 3D design um, and was always very interested in designing but had a real thirst to learn making because I, I kind of felt like the two go hand in hand um, and so I explored different options so p- uh, potentially a, a cabinet making apprenticeship um, so went for an interview for that and uh, that's where I found out about Rycote Wood because that's where the person interviewing me had studied um, and if it wasn't for them my life would have followed a very different course so very grateful to them and their recommendation um, and yeah I'm very patriotic of being from the north so I never thought I'd leave um, but yeah I find myself living in Oxford six years after graduating so feel a bit of a traitor but <laughs> um yeah. yeah I live and work in Oxford now and do lots of different woodworking jobs having done the furniture design and make degree at Ryko Wood. One thing about Ryko Wood is there's a lot of making which I loved um would you say it's made you more of a maker or more of a designer after leaving? I think I I went into it having more experience in design and those sort of skills um and so I was really there for the making and the fact yeah. that you got your own workbench in the workshop for the whole three years was exactly what I wanted uh, I didn't want a typical university experience I wanted to just yeah. be in there Monday to Friday nine to five like slogging and learning as much as I could um so I, I think I guess uh yeah I, I became more of a maker while I was there but now that I've left the two are very much um important to me so I, I would describe myself as a designer maker for sure. Okay so after Rycote Wood I hear you worked for Urkel which must have been an amazing experience can you tell us what you were doing for them? Yeah I mean I was kind of shocked that I got employed to be honest as a graduate um but they I think they just you know, they want to support young people and get give them experience in industry. Um, and yeah, I got employed as a design engineer. Uh, so that is sort of um, a, an in-between role between, I was based in the design department, but I very much had to go down to the factory and the production team and kind of liaise with them. Um, so it wasn't the most creative role. I'd say it's more um, problem solving and kind of working out how a design is actually going to be made. So doing a lot of the CAD models, the drawings, um, yeah, talking with the jig shop about how the prototype is going to be made versus how it's going to actually be, be made in production. Um, and also doing jobs uh, if they were going to exhibitions, like designing the stand or the layout of the furniture for exhibitions and shops. Um, so, yeah, I've got a bit of experience doing loads of things um, and as well as doing some education 
projects um so collaborating with schools and with Rycote Wood itself so yeah. yeah so you now actually teach back at Rycote Wood um it must be really rewarding seeing the students get so much enjoyment about out of it and and seeing them learn new skills you know the knowledge you're passing down how much how important is teaching to you I I think I actually come from a family of teachers, like a lot of my family work in education, whether that's university or primary schools. Um, So I think it's kind of in my blood uh, to want to share knowledge. Um, And I think my teaching experience started even when I was a student. I like um, I initiated running workshops in the local community whilst I was still learning. Um, And to me, that's almost, you know, I was paying my university fees to study And it almost felt a bit like, you know, the Robin Hood. I'm kind of taking from the university and I'm sharing that knowledge with with people for for like a fraction of the cost. Um, And so it's really important to me just sharing in this kind of collaborative process of learning, because as you're teaching someone, you're also learning and kind of developing your own practice. So I I think it's just as beneficial to me um, as it is for students. Um, and yeah, it's really nice being back at Rycote Wood in that um, in that capacity. Um, I run the Saturday Club there, which is a free course for 13 to 16 year olds. And it's usually done over 15 weeks. Um, and essentially what I want to try and do with that, they don't get a qualification out of it, but they do just get an introduction to designing and making. Uh, yeah. So the main outcome is that it has to be fun and engaging. Um, and I I, re- I think I, uh, all the feedback I've got has been really positive. So I feel like I've been successful in uh, sort of creating that environment for the students. And you got to plan the, the projects they made. It wasn't a set thing. So what, what projects do you make with them? Yeah, I mean, I felt like I'd just been given the keys to like, <laughs> I don't know, the to to just uh having an amazing time um the yeah I was just given total freedom over writing the course which when you're a young um you know when you're new to the teaching practice that's like such a big responsibility so I was really grateful for that um so what we what we made the first year what we did a couple of introductory um projects just to get the students to know each other and comfortable in the workshop uh, and introduce them to hand tools Uh, And then we just launched straight into making um, their final project. I think maybe over 12 weeks, they they made a small small sort of table stool type thing. Uh, It had uh, two side frames that were bridal jointed together. And then the the other two um, rails were kind of dowel jointed through the bridal joint. Uh, So, yeah, two two joints that they learnt and they all did that cut by hand um and then we did a veneered uh, plywood top as well uh which in hindsight was an incredibly ambitious project to do with 16 young people uh, a lot of the time I was teaching them on my own so it was okay. very full on but it was incredibly rewarding to see their faces at the end of the course and just seeing their progression um yeah I think there was one 12 year old who'd snuck in and he was the student that just sort of excelled the most uh, despite only being 12 it was amazing to see wow so yeah these were complete beginners I, I imagine but had an interest in in uh, making and I guess they weren't allowed to use the machines at Ryko Wood um well so I did allow like, under very close supervision um they yeah. were allowed to use like bands or um disc sand and pillow drill um and I th- and a lot, you know, when I was in edu- like at school and in education, um, you were allowed to use uh, machines and things, but just under very like um, like small parameters. Yeah, either the yeah. teacher had to be there or like you weren't given that men- much freedom or opportunities to explore the machines. And and I think the fact that they were able to have that experience in the Saturday Club, they all said was like the biggest, the, the main thing they enjoyed. So. I think just uh, obviously making sure it's done safely, but just giving students that uh, freedom and responsibility, uh, I think they really appreciate. Yeah, that that is an amazing experience. I definitely wish I I did that when I was that age. So Same. it sounds like Ryko. <laughs> yeah, it sounds like Ryko would 
is a big part of your journey. And while you were studying there in your final years, like I mentioned, you were in the Young Furniture Makers Awards, winning the best in show in 2018. How has that helped you and your journey and your business? Yeah, I mean, I can even remember that moment. Um, there were three cate- um, three categories or two categories. There was definitely a design and a bespoke um, a, a category. Uh, and I think I was put into the bespoke category. And then um, actually a friend of mine, Beatrice, Beatrice Bray won that one uh, so I heard her name called out and was obviously very pleased for her but was like yeah. oh well I've not won my category but hey ho so I sort yeah. of like turned off a little bit <laughs> and started chatting to my friends and then uh, and then I just heard my name called out and then I just like clocked eyes with everyone and was just like what's going on did uh, you not know what it was for <laughs> uh I think I did but I just completely it, it was for award for best in show sponsored by Blum. And to me, that was just so out of my uh, reach that I just was like, oh, well, I'm not even going to like listen for my name because it's obviously not going to be me. Um, yeah. And then it was. So I had to go up to the stage just kind of paralyzed with laughter because I was just like, this is so <laughs> unexpected. Um, and but but at the same time, I was just like it was such an it genuinely felt like an honor or like a real recognition because the piece yeah. that um it was for was called Cor- it's called Corky's Cabinet it's uh it was the final piece that I made whilst at Rikerwood um the piece that I made in response to my dissertation and it had such an incredible personal meaning to me it uh it came out of my research into like the power of craft as a healing process for those who've been bereaved so and that comes out of a personal experience so to have such a recognition for such a personal piece it was just yeah like one of the highlights of my furniture making journey today I'd say yeah I bet so after winning what other opportunities have come your way and uh, how has that helped you um, with your future endeavours um, yeah, I feel like I've been really lucky since graduating. Um, yeah, well, getting the Urkel job was amazing. I was with them for a year. And whilst I was there, as I said, got lots of opportunities to work um, doing education projects. Um, and I and one of them being a self-initiated project called Creative Clinic, where uh, we worked with Didcot Girls School. Um, and we went in, me and two other members of uh, staff, Uh, Urkel staff Uh, we went in with loads of Urkel um, uh, components that had you know they they weren't suitable for production either e.g they had cracks in the wood or yeah slight splits um, or yeah they were like seconds essentially yeah Uh, so we just sort of raided the bins took a load of um, Urkel components which you know if to anyone that knows Urkel in their design um it's quite iconic like the smooth rounded shapes um they're just like beautiful objects in themselves so we got to take a load of those and then just let the students basically design anything design and make whatever they wanted from these components uh, and the the winning team came up with like this really cool um it I can't, I can't even say what it was it was just sort of a a structure that a child would sit in and they'd move objects around as like a little play space for for children yeah. so it was, um so that that was great uh Urkel you know supported me doing that and uh, they also sponsored an exhibition that I had at the old fire station in Oxford um so incredibly supportive and I think the longer that I was there and doing those type of projects I realized education is so important to me and that's kind of the direction I want to go in um so I left Urkel had a few months out just to sort of focus on this girl makes and kind of have a bit of a breather um because you know I felt like I'd just been running non-stop and I just needed a bit of a rest um and then I got the job with the NHS uh which I still do now so that's three days a week um and I, I do I work in a rehab facility so with people who've had brain injuries or strokes um, and we do woodwork with them as part of them, um, you know, either relearning like cognitive skills like problem solving or they might only have use of one hand and they need to learn how to adapt to that 
that major life changing thing, um, and yeah. which I find that incredibly rewarding. It's really good. Yeah. So obviously, education is now a big part of your life. You touched on this girl makes, but that's that's so impressive. You're the founder of this girl makes. If people don't know, can you tell us about what it's all about and why it's so important? Um, so yeah, I started This Girl Makes, which is, um, I describe it as a project because even though it does, uh, it does have income streams, so it is sort of a business. Uh, I don't do it for the money. I do it for the social cause that it stands for. Um, and I started it at college, uh, in my second year because whilst I was at, uh, Rikertwood, there was about 20% of the students that were women, And I think that number gradually dropped off as I progressed through the course. And I think now there's probably less than 20 percent of the students that are female. So uh, or identify as female. So um, I just, you know, as as a woman myself, I just when I was in that environment, uh, especially at a young age, when you're trying to figure out who you are and who you want to be, I just thought it, it should be more of an issue that people are talking about and trying to understand why this is the case and how we can maybe make it better. Um, because I believe that a more balanced environment is going to be beneficial to everyone. Um, so I went about uh, writing a blog called This Girl Makes, which interviewed women in craft and design um, and more just as a selfish thing I needed to find myself role models people I could identify with and people that I could potentially be in the future um, just to help me kind of motivate me through the course Um, and then writing the blog sort of turned into offering workshops as I've mentioned so going into community spaces like galleries um, museums Uh, community centers and working with different groups of people and bringing craft to them and um, just engaging them with it and uh, and I work with lots of different people um, all different ages abilities and genders Um, but there is a real focus on trying to diversify the types of people that are interested in woodwork because it you know I found it such a healing process so I, I feel like I should share that with as many people who are interested um and so today this girl makes um I now I work at Rikertwood a lot of the workshops I offer are via them uh because they've obviously got amazing facilities and the the rest of the teachers are a great resource so it's good to be around them and able to ask them questions um and I I think um for the future I I think I'd quite like to maybe develop this girl makes a bit more make it more have more of a structured business model so it's something I could potentially do more full-time um or or go freelance and kind of um just offer it offer offer more things (laughs) basically I, I think it's very important getting more women in the industry do you think woodwork is taught in a way at the moment maybe a bit old-fashioned or is taught in a way that is putting off the women uh good question um I think there's it's a multifaceted issue and there's lots of factors that um contribute to this um uh kind of disparity in gender representation in the industry um and and obviously education is a massive part of that so uh when I was a student um at a level the 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 it was um the technology department were all men and older men um as well so a bit harder to relate when there's such a big yeah. age gap as well uh but actually the fit the year that I took a level they hired the first female um teacher and she was uh like a newly qualified teacher as well so that made a massive difference to my experience um, and then also when I was at Rikertwood in the second year, they employed uh, Dr. Lynn Jones as a tutor. And again, that it almost seems like these things happened and for a reason, because they like really sparked inspiration, just having someone in the teaching team that was uh, somebody I could relate more to. Um, so they, yeah, having women teachers for women students is really important, I think. Uh, but but also just for everyone you know it's not it's not just oh this is a space for women and it's only going to help them it's it's I think feminism is also for men and it's about just making society and systems more inclusive and actually beneficial um and 
I, I, I don't have a, an official framework that I do my teaching uh, to or specific model I refer to, but I'd say I definitely take more of a, a human approach. I kind of uh, try and change my approach as a teacher in order to meet the student. And uh, I mean, a, a bit like, especially if I'm working in a therapeutic context, I think it's really important to be there for the student in a sort of guidance way um like emotionally um but also you know how what, what's their learning style how can I actually communicate the information in a way that's going to register with them and keep them engaged and motivated uh because a massive part of learning is your emotional connection with the subject and I think you know I have a massive massive emotional connection to woodwork so I feel like that helps me as a teacher be a bit more empathetic to students yeah so to get m- more of the younger people interested in woodworking and, and know it's an option you know for the secondary schools there is a few that still have design technology but in primary school there's sort of no making at all do you think it should be you know offered to a younger age and sort of some sort of workshop should be implemented at the primary school age Hmm. Um, so it's interesting because in my experience of education, I went to a three tier system. So first school, middle school and high school. Um, so when people talk about primary, I have to remind myself that's um, <laughs> year one to six, isn't it? Yeah. Um, yeah, I think the younger, the better. You know, the I think the the tact like the tactile haptic skills of making and exploring the world through our hands um is just it's like a you know it's a, a thing that goes right back to like caveman times it's such a natural and primitive um thing that humans do so I think you know that should be part of learning in primary schools for sure um and also I think there's I guess we live in like a health and safety conscious society so the thought of giving saws and chisels and planes to like a bunch of kids is seen as scary but if it's done in a sort of controlled smaller um, more intimate environment then there's absolutely no reason young people can't get involved um, yeah. and uh, just to sort of as an example um, a maker called Peter Lanyon who does a lot of green woodwork who I know um, I, I see on his Instagram, he does loads of making with his really young daughter and she's even making like little chairs for her bunny rabbit toy and is now selling those to her friends. So I, I just think that's yeah. a lovely example of where, you know, nobody's ever too young to start making, basically. Yeah. OK, so now I'm going to change the topic. So what perception of woodworking would you like changed? So, for example, my perception I'd like changed is I don't think woodworking is sort of seen as an art form. You know, people, when they talk about the art art forms, they, you know, they see paintings on the wall and, and sculptures. But I believe if people start seeing woodworking in furniture as and, and us as artists, then people would understand, you know, ha- would, you know appreciate handmade furniture more. So that's that's my opinion. But is there any <laughs> perception of woodworking you'd like changed? Um, well, I definitely agree with you. Um, the number of times and a lot of them recently, I've been <laughs> somebody said, oh, could you make some furniture for me? And then I'll say, OK, it'll probably be ballpark figure this much. And then they're blown away. And yeah. and I and I just think, well, you know, if you wanted something cheap, why don't you go to Ikea? Like, but if you're asking me to make it, then you've got to take into account all my time and energy that goes into problem solving and bringing that piece into existence. So I, I fully <laughs> get your yeah. point. Um, so I think that and I think yeah there's just a lot of stereotypes uh and it happens a lot even in my NHS job where uh, I work with um an older man called John who's been a great mentor uh and a lot of the time people will automatically speak to him rather than speaking to me because they just assume yeah. I'm like the apprentice who is not trained in woodwork um and although John is a lot older than me so he has a lot more you know knowledge and experience 
I have my own knowledge and experience and I've done a lot of things that he's actually not done. So, for example, we bought a festival domino jointer for the workshop recently, trying to get it into the 21st century finally. Um, And that's been a great thing to, um, you know, make more complex projects with patients, uh, especially those who are maybe retraining to go back to work because it's like an industry standard tool. Um, and he'd never used one before. So if anything, I'm the expert on that. Um, so I think this perception that if, you know, it's for older men, um, that and actually it's not, it's, um, it's a craft that requires a certain set of knowledge and skills and a real enthusiasm. Um, and if anyone has that, it's, it's you know, they can excel in the craft. Um, and I think... I don't know. I feel I could think more about it and offer you some more examples, but that's the main one. That's the main bug there. Yeah, no, I, (laughs) I totally understand that. Um, well, I also, um, I've experienced that in a way in terms of my age, because, you know, being very young and it's quite, it's seen as quite a mature sort of hobby or industry so if I was in a room with a bunch of other woodworkers who are much older they would look at me and think what does he know so I I I know exactly what you're talking about there what's the most rewarding thing about the whole woodworking process from the design to the end result working with people is the most rewarding and I think this is also partly the reason I don't I haven't gone and got a job as a maker in a workshop is the thing I enjoy most is actually working with people and bringing their ideas to life and kind of collaborating and, um, you know, coming up with something unique and original that's not necessarily a product and more of the process. Um, and, and I don't want to necessarily be on a factory line just churning out things. I want to, you know, work in a more holistic, slower um, way with people. Um, so meet to me that that's rewarding (laughs) but you mentioned you do want to sort of get back into in in the industry and start making your own furniture again uh yeah so uh I mean I I, I'm very um I'm trying to juggle a lot of things at the moment but I have just um agreed to do a a commission for someone so I've, I've sort of set up a workshop in my garage um and I've also got a few friends who've got their own workshops so collaborating with them um, yeah. is hopefully a way where I can actually start doing my own practice alongside all the other jobs that I'm doing. Yeah. And do you, would you say you have a style in your design and making? Uh, I, I definitely have a visual style that kind of developed as I was at Rycotewood. And it's something I really want to like um, develop more and kind of explore more, um, which hence the garage work uh, workshop. Um, and I would describe it as I really like honest construction, so visible joints, um, like wedged or pegged joints. Yeah. Um, I just think they have a real, um, they sort of tell the narrative of the piece and how it was made, and they're just visually quite interesting. Um, and also, I I just really like wood. So as soon as you start adding like metal brackets and hinges and fixtures and fittings, it all becomes a bit too mechanical for me and I just really like you know tapping a dowel into a hole that's just a really nice yeah. uh it almost takes you back to childhood just sort of like you know wooden blocks and things so I think to me I want my pieces to feel fun and playful and um make you feel a sense of enjoyment when you see them or interact with them so Corky's cabinet the piece that won uh, best in show um at the Young Furniture Makers exhibition, that has a lot of curves to it. Um, it has uh, like little fingers, which are the sides of the drawers that extend beyond the cabinet. So it almost looks like two little hands that are reaching out to you. Um, and then you pull the fingers to open the drawer. And then essentially it looks like the cabinet is trying to give you a hug. So, n- wow. you know, <laughs> um, it's a playful piece. It, it does have a function, but it, I, I'm not trying to just make I you know I'm not trying to take on board IKEA and just like make really functional pieces. I I want to make something that's a bit more fun and interactive and uh, like an art, a piece of art, as you said. Um, I would yeah. consider myself an artist as well. 
That's uh, your point of exposed joints. Uh, I really resonate with. And I heard a phrase a while ago about honest woodworking, uh, about if the, the customer can see the handmade element to it, like the handmade joinery, then they can appreciate the amount of work that goes into it. And if you are buying a handmade piece, why would you want it to look like it was mass produced? Is, is one way to look at it. So showing the hand cut joints is a really good way of doing that, I think. Yeah, definitely. So you've, you mentioned, uh, well, obviously we know you won the prize and you've experienced entering a competition and winning, but now you're doing a bit of judging. Uh, for example, the competition Axminster is running. What do you look for when you're judging a piece now? Hmm, that's uh, interesting. Um... Yeah, I'd, I mean, obviously, um, a good piece of furniture needs to sort of, you know, be well made, it needs to not fall apart, um, and have some element of functionality to it. Um, so I, I think there's kind of like the basics you look for as a judge, um, and just like, is it fit for purpose, that type of thing. But but maybe it doesn't need to be fit for purpose if there's more of a concept behind it. Um, and I think as long as that is communicated by the maker in a, in a way that I can understand as a judge, then I will consider the narrative of the piece just as much as the kind of physical, um, you know, structure of it. Um, so yeah, as a, you know, in my work, I really want to tell a story. So I'm always trying to look at another maker's piece and think what are they trying to communicate to me and does it resonate or maybe it doesn't resonate with me but how successful have they been in trying to communicate that concept um so uh yeah for example I judged uh I was a guest judge for the Alan Peters award um last year uh, which was online for the first time and uh, it didn't win but one of the pieces that was entered uh, happened to be a friend of mine uh, called Freddie Keane and he graduated from the uh, Royal uh, the Royal College of Art and did a master's in furniture making there and his piece he entered his final piece and uh, that was a, sort of a wedge uh, three wedge tenon stool so quite sort of you know basic kind of principle of making a stool but he designed it for to be made by people who are partially sighted or completely blind so um enable in in order to kind of you know make it inclusive of people who are um who aren't able to see he'd put almost like braille type details into the wood so they could identify which part of the component it was and which slot it went into um and I just thought that was done with a real um you know just a real sort of sensitivity and um aesthetically it looked lovely because you had all these kind of punctured marks in the wood or like dimples in the wood um which I and I just I really appreciated that because one it's trying to make craft more inclusive and two it was just done in a really nice way um and presented yeah. presented lovely so um yeah, <laughs> yeah. well we just had Chris Fisher the the blind woodturner on the podcast and I think he would be really interested in that mm. so uh hope, hopefully he's listening and he'll check that out <laughs> Out of the Woodwork is brought to you by Axminster Tools. Nobody is more passionate or knowledgeable about woodworking than us. A market leader in mail order tools and the machinery industry, we offer a friendly and personal service to thousands of woodworkers all around the world. Whether you're a trade professional, business owner, education leader, amateur DIYer, or a hobby enthusiast, we share your passion. Discover more about Axminster Tools, visit www.axminstertools.com. So when you're judging yourself and you're looking at a lot of other pieces, uh, are you in, does that inspire your work? Where do you find inspiration from? I consider myself a very creative person and I'm very sensitive to things. So I think all... and just day to day all around me I can be inspired or be given an emotion by something which might trigger a kind of creative brainstorming process um I I'm very much a social person so I think my interactions with people and hearing their stories can really motivate me and um 
And I, I definitely like to retreat and kind of have time to process and think about ideas. So, um, you know, as much as I'm social and like to be around people, when I actually come to design and make, I definitely need quiet space and a, a sort of space in a workshop where I can just sort of put my head down and focus. Um, and I grew up, uh, my I grew up with a great aunt who was a, a potter. She's the only kind of crafts person in my family. I don't come from a family of makers. Um, yeah. And I think just growing up around here where her house, she's made most of the things in her house and she's got lots of art books all around the house. So whenever I go and visit, I just, you know, I find it an incredibly inspiring environment to be in. So for anyone struggling to find inspiration or hasn't really got a design process, have you got any advice for anyone starting out and struggling in that area? That's a really good question because, um, yeah, I think there's no, um, you can't tell someone how to design. Well, I mean, you can show them um, strategies and kind of tips, but I think ultimately it's a personal thing. So I think you kind of almost have to lay down all the options and then people pick and choose what resonates with them. So for me, um, when I was at Rikertwood, the process that I developed um, kind of came out of my uh, interest in illustration and sketchbooking and collage. So, you know, right from the point where we get given the creative brief, um, I will go away and do visual research. So things that I think of when I read the brief um, or just sort of associations I'm making or areas that I want to focus on whilst during the project. And I'll print off all those pictures and I will cut them up and almost make like collage bits of furniture. Um, so I might have a leg from one bit of furniture that I like, or I might have an object that's completely not related to furniture as a tabletop. Um, so just as a really quick way of sketching out what's in my brain, because um, even though I love drawing, I wouldn't say I'm really good at drawing things that don't currently exist. Um, so to yeah. me, collage is a really good way of actually just getting those ideas onto paper. Um, and then once I've done that, I'll then start actually thinking, OK, it's a bit of furniture. How is this going to be made with wood um, or whatever material I choose? And um, and then I'll start actually sketching those ideas out and do 3D sketching with bits of, you know, bits of wood and actual model making. Um, and I think, yeah, that's a process that I kind of came to and that I find really useful. So for anyone else who doesn't think they are that great at drawing or don't feel that confident then try collage I think it's uh, also just quite a fun process to do um, and again like 3D sketching you can actually just find offcuts and actually stick them together as a sort of 3D drawing um, and yeah. so I, those are some recommendations I'd give to students. I definitely agree with the collaging and, and, and mood boards and you mentioned you don't find it easy drawing something that doesn't exist. One thing I've tried in the past that the listeners might find useful is if you like, a, if you want to design a chair and you print out lots of pictures of chairs you like the look of, if you get some tracing paper and you lay them over the top of the chair and kind of trace over the chairs, but move the positioning of the components, maybe lower the rail, uh, or I find that really interesting because you can adapt all the designs you like and then after all those tracing over already existing designs, you might be able to come up with something unique. So you're currently studying for your PGCE. Can you tell us more about that? And because I can imagine that's really exciting for you. Yeah, it's been a really, uh, a really great opportunity, again, that just sort of came along at the right time and everything fitted into place. Um, uh, so I'm currently working for Rikertwood as a teacher. So they've actually sponsored for me to do this teaching qualification um which I I just jumped at because it's a recognized qualification and I think it'll just validate me as an educator and wherever I work it's it's going to be almost like a, a proof that I am capable um and it's just been I, I I've had I have tons of enthusiasm and motivation to do teaching but this qualification has just helped me um, order that process so planning proper preparation how to think about learners needs and how best to support them and uh, and it's uh, I have to do two um, 
to what's the word uh, placements so the Saturday club is one placement and my hospital job is the other and then so I, I do those and I have obs- observed sessions and get feedback um, and then I also learn all the theory and kind of um, sort of techniques of teaching in one day a week um, as a student um, and so all of that together over the past two years um, has just at, like it made my teaching practice just excel. Um, I have so a lot more confidence now in approaching big groups of learners. And um, one thing I always used to do was just get so stressed out and panic. And I realized that is just the worst thing you can do and it's not going to help yeah. anyone. So just actually learning to like take a step back and breathe and um there's no rush just sort of like I will help people as I am able to and that's been one of the main takeaways from the whole experience um and yeah once I finish I'm gonna have a bit more free time so I'm hoping I can put that free time into um, doing stuff in my home workshop and actually doing more freelance kind of designing and making for people so a lot of your teaching is in person have you thought about doing any remote teaching or or some video tutorials or lectures online yeah it's really interesting um obviously that that was the big thing posed by the pandemic was how do we keep our teaching and craft alive when everything's now virtual um and so definitely try to explore that um at the hospital um outpatients weren't allowed to come in so we kind of considered Uh, doing like a blended approach so maybe they start off doing a couple of sessions in person when or if they're able to um, and then they take their components home and assemble them at home or finish them at home Um, and we do like um, yeah like a virtual call um, so we can talk them through the process or they can ask questions Um, or potentially um, what one thing I try to do as part of this girl makes is develop like Uh, kits that we can post out to people they can assemble them at home some are for more um, younger learners or um, you know more entry level making skills and then some are slightly more advanced and require hand tools and things Um, and then I I recorded myself making the project and they were able to sort of build at home along with the video yeah Um, so yeah and a lot of those um projects I offered in person anyway so actually converting it to online was a relatively easy process um but a really interesting process nonetheless from a teaching point of view trying to think how do you communicate everything they need to know in a video um and I know you've got loads of experience of that that's sort of what you do really isn't it so I think kits are a really good idea actually especially in the pandemic um what kits did you make and are you going to make more of them um so I've got two that I currently offer uh one is a sort of CNC plywood um toolbox design which is sort of pegged together with dowels um there's not a lot of like making involved it's more assembling and kind of you know working out what component goes where and then people get to finish it in whatever way they choose so that's great for um yeah as I say like younger learners but also um, I've done that with quite a few patients from the from the workshop at the NHS because, um, you know, if you think about somebody's had a stroke, they might have a weaker side. So actually getting them to do a task that's two handed and involves them actually having to, like, push things together and slot things into holes. You know, I think <laughs> there's a lot of people in woodworking who just take for granted how involved um some of the skills are and and you know yeah to somebody who's had a life-changing incident like a stroke trying to relearn those basic skills of just using your two hands or trying to do a dexterous task um there's so much involved and cognitive as well trying to like orientate components um so I, I think yeah just have more of an appreciation of how difficult the craft is and actually like you know, especially this is a shout out to anyone who's learning. Um, when I was at Rycotewood, I doubted myself all the time and I still do. And no matter how much you learn or how many awards you win, I always um, 
didn't think it was good enough so I just want to say to anyone who's learning like it's a really hard craft and there's a reason it takes many years to um get to a standard and so just be kind to yourself you know every every lesson is important and every mistake is a lesson so um yeah just keep going basically and don't don't give up um the the second um uh kit is one of these hexagonal stools um <laughs> which is uh got a three wedge tenon joint there um so this is uh essentially all the components are already prepared and they're mailed out to somebody um and then they do the kind of gluing up tapping the wedge in and using a flush saw for the top and perhaps a block plane so just as a, a little introduction to all the basic hand tools and kind of skills involved um again we take so much for granted and actually to somebody who's never done woodwork there's so much to learn just in that um two hour workshop that they might do so um so yeah yeah that that definitely is going to get people inspired to want to start making and your point of um you know don't be hard on yourself is we've both been woodworking for a long time I'm coming up on 11 years been woodworking and I'm still learning and even if you're incredibly experienced there's still so much to learn you'll never stop learning I I saw an interview uh, from a woodworker who I think's you know 70 years old and he said he's still learning every single day um, and while I was at Brico Wood we were, you know we, you were doing dovetail training and the first dovetail you cut was terrible I think we had to cut five dovetails in a morning or in a day in the first year. And you just saw the progression from each one. And it's amazing. You, you think you can only see progression over, you know, years, you know, of work. But just repeating a dovetail in a morning, you know, you can see the progression. So definitely don't be hard on yourself for any, any beginners listening. Um, just try and enjoy it, you know. And if it's if the dovetail doesn't come out right, then you if it came out perfect I'd be worried you know, yeah. <laughs> you know, you know then then what is there to learn because learning right, exactly. is, is the fun part definitely yeah and I was just gonna add I think um when I went to Rykert Wood I was I, I started when I must have been about 19 so yeah you know in the grand scheme of things that's still incredibly young and I think when I went there the thing I really wanted to learn was just how to use all the tools how to actually make things and so that's what I was focusing all my energy and attention on and got me really excited. Um, and and then since um, leaving college and actually like working now and having to help other people make, I'm now learning all the other things that are involved. And I never grew up with an appreciation of tools or even an understanding of how they worked or what they were really. And only now I'm kind of understanding why it's so important to know about tools and um you know sharpening being the main example of that if you don't have a sharp tool then you're going to make the job a lot harder for yourself so yeah. um not just the creative making side of things but also like the maintenance side of things I think that's what I'm now appreciating and having to yeah. learn more about so yeah always learning <laughs> yeah definitely uh, learning the inside and out of a machine is really interesting what do you wish you knew before you started woodworking? I think I, I'd i always done drawing and kind of came from an illustration, graphic design sort of background. Um, and so I think I was used to working in 2D and then actually changing to work thinking in 3D. <laughs> yeah, as I said, you take so much for granted and like some people's brains are just wired in different ways or, you know, if you don't have lots of experience as a child making, it means it's harder for you to then think in those kind of ways as you get older. So I think when I started at Reichert Wood, I felt really insecure about my inability to think in 3D and visualise things, um, which is now completely different. I feel like now I've manage to um sort yeah. of exercise that part of my brain but um but yeah I think just going going into college and people describing things and I was like I'm totally lost I need to draw it in order to visualize what you're saying um so yeah I think had I had that ability going into Rykert would I would have you know excelled even quicker so yeah well, before we go, uh, for anyone wanting to find your work and, and learn more about you, where can everyone find you? 
they can find me on my website thisgirlmakes.com um and you can also contact me there I'd love to hear from everyone and anyone um and uh, I'm also on Instagram there's my private account which is hat underscore speed um and there's also this at this girl makes um so you can give me a follow and drop me a message if you've got any questions or want to collaborate I'm always open um to meeting new people and doing new projects yeah well thank you so much for joining me Hattie I really enjoyed it it's great talking to you and uh, I'm sure the listeners really enjoyed it as well oh thanks so much Sean it was lovely to speak to you too yeah see you soon all right bye Bye-bye. Join us again next time for another episode of Out of the Woodwork. For more episodes, to listen and subscribe, search for Out of the Woodwork on all major podcast sites, including Apple Podcasts and Spotify. For more woodworking project guides, demos, tools, reviews, and more, visit www.axminstertools.com.